Okay, we are going to start our program at this time. And I would like at this time to just make one special introduction, actually two. I want to introduce to you the former First Lady of Kansas State University, and that's Ruth Ann Weefold. Ruth Ann, will you stand up? And we are also privileged today to have here with us the president of Central Lakes College, Dr. Hera Charlier. Hera, please stand up. I deem it a high honor to introduce to you today an accomplished public servant of the first rank and a person who has made a big difference in the lives of so many people. That person is Dr. John Weefault, the President Emeritus of Kansas State University. Dr. Weefault served as President of Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas from 1986 to 2009. During his tenure at Kansas State, President Weefault took a university that was in decline and turned it into a powerhouse. He took both Kansas State University's basketball and football teams that had not had a winning season in more than 30 years and put them into the top 10 rank of teams across universities. When Dr. Weefault became president of Kansas State University, they were in a crisis of declining enrollments, and he took them from 15,000 students in 1986 to 24,000 students in 2009. Also, President Weefault brought three US presidents to Kansas State University to visit and to speak. Presidents Jimmy Carter, Presidents Bill Clinton, and President George W. Bush. In 2016, the Kansas State University Board of Regents named a new $80 million building after John Weefault in his honor. Previous to his work at Kansas State, Dr. Weefault established early on an exemplary record of public service. Following receiving his PhD in history at the University of Michigan, Weefault taught history for five years at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota. In 1971, Minnesota Governor Wendell Anderson appointed him Minnesota Commissioner of Agriculture, which is where I got to know John when he testified before the House Agriculture Committee, of which I was a member then and the future chairman of. Both Governor Anderson and Governor Rudy Perpich stated that John Weefault was their best commissioner of all the serving agency commissioners at that time. In 1972, when Minnesota's Hubert H. Humphrey was running for President of the United States, he publicly stated that his first decision as President would be to appoint John Weefault to be the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture in the President's Cabinet. Then in 1978, at a time when the Minnesota Legislature was about to close Southwest State University due to both a crisis of severe declining enrollments and faculty frat recital infighting that was taking place at the time, Weefault was named its president. Within a year, within a year, he turned the crisis around and is credited with having saved Southwest State. In May of 2007, President Weefault was invited back to Southwest State to deliver its commencement address and to receive an honorary PhD doctorate degree from Southwest State University. And on that day, I have the newspaper editorial. The editor of the Marshall Independent Newspaper wrote an editorial about Dr. Weefault coming back to the university he was president of from 1977 to 1981. The editorial said, quote, mention the name John Weefault around campus and things stop. There is a hushed reverence when people talk about the man, John Weefault, the guy who saved Southwest State University, end of quote. Following Southwest State University, John was appointed the chancellor of the Minnesota State University System, and after five years there in that position, he went on to Kansas State as its president for 23 years. Dr. Weefault's speech today will be about the leadership principles that will lead you to success in life. With no further ado, it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. John Weefault, President Emeritus of Kansas State University. Steve, that's good. That's good.
Hello, Central Lakes College. And of course, all of the members of the Rosemeyer Forum. Listen, I am thrilled. I am so grateful that I was invited to give this speech. And it, it is on leadership principles. And um, so when I say the title is, um, uh, when I go through these principles, let me just say, you can write this down. That if you follow these principles, you will be successful. I'm just telling you that right now. So uh, listen to all of these characters. And it's not like, I'm not talking about math or science here. I'm just talking about little things that if you follow those, you will be a success no matter what you do. So today I'm going to talk about leadership principles that if you follow, I've only got eight, you know, that's two fewer than Moses. No, eight principles, I, I'm not kidding you now, if you follow them, I don't care if you're a basketball or a football player or a great student here at Central Lakes, and you follow these, you will make it to the top. So let me start out the speech before I get into the uh, characteristics or the eight principles that will lead to leadership. Uh, just a few comments about the world we live in and uh, then a few comments about America. So let me just start out by talking about America. I mean, because we're living in a country that you can be whatever you want to be. Do you understand that? Now, we might be the only country on the face of the earth where if you have the desire and the will, you can make it to the top. It's called the United States of America. America in 2019 still remains as the greatest country in the world, especially in terms of freedom, equality, and liberty for all. So as John Winthrop declared in 1631, he said this in 1631. He said this. We are going to have a city on the hill that radiates liberty, equality, and justice for all to the entire world. So in 2019, America still is, despite our deficiencies and problems, and we have them just like any other country, we are still the one country in the world where you can virtually be anything you want to be. So what is it about America? America is a country where you can be at the bottom, like I was, and go to the top. You can be nobody one day and somebody the next. You got that? And you can go from the valley to the mountaintop. Martin Luther King said this in front of 250,000 people. And he said many, many things. You know, it was about a 50-minute speech. But for me, the bottom line was, you can look in the mirror and say what? I am somebody. Look, there is no other country in the world where you can look in the mirror and say, I can be somebody. No, not one. So now let's just take a minute or so and talk about the rest of the world. Out of about 7 billion people in the world today, about 3 billion of the 7 billion go to bed hungry every night. Most of them don't have clean water and sanitation facilities. Think about this. They're living like Americans did in the 18th century. You know that there are about a billion people in the world today that can't read or write? Think about that. 
they cannot read or write. So millions of people live in countries that, if you read the paper or listen to the news, uh, you know about what outliers there are. Russia, North Korea, China. I mean, Chairman Xi is not too far removed from Mao. You've got to understand that. He's more of a Maoist than he is an FDR. You got that? And then you had Venezuela. You know, 30 years ago, they were the richest country in Latin America. And today, it's on the verge of collapse. And then you've got Cuba, Saudi Arabia. You know, I mean, Saudi Arabia, I mean, they're one of our allies, but they're hardly great friends. Then you have Iran. Here's the deal about Iran. You know, for 5,000 years, they were the Persian Empire. They were the traitors of the entire Middle and Near East. And today they have an Islamic Republic that is basically an Islamic dictatorship where there is hardly any freedom at all. Well, just for a second here, I know you're, many of you are at Central Lakes. But think of how many millions of people in the world would give up everything to move to a state like Minnesota. You got that? Or to enroll at a really fine school like Central Lakes College. I mean, they'd give up everything. They would give up everything to come here. Now, before I list these uh, eight principles, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Let me start out by saying a person's IQ or ACT scores are not critical. OK, you got that? It's a success. Now, in part, I say this because when I was a sophomore, I actually have the transcript. They said my IQ was 108. You know, everybody in this room's got a higher IQ than I do. Okay, I mean, virtually everybody in this room has a higher IQ than I do. If I had to take the ACC score, I'd be lucky to get 20. And yet I'm standing here as a 23-year president of Kansas State. So uh, I, I think it was in my sophomore year, I took tests in math, science, geography, state and local government, and I got less than 50% on all those students. So you know, think about you and how well you're doing. I couldn't even get 50% in these tests. Well, OK, then one day my English teacher, uh, Ann Ackerman, I'll never forget her. I mean, she was a really good teacher. When she looked at you, you didn't say a thing. But she called me in in my senior year. I don't know why. She wasn't uh, an advisor. Uh, I, she called me in. She might have called others in, too. And she said something like this. She said, John, what do you want to do next year? So I said, well, I'd like to go to college. And she said, you're not smart enough. Join the Army or work for Woolworths. I don't know if you remember Woolworths. It was a five and 10 cent store. No, I was going to be a clerk. No, just be a clerk. Yeah, just be a clerk. Or join the Army. You know what I thought in my mind? We'll see about that. So I was able to go to. Pacific Lutheran. So how many times have I thought about Ann Ackerman? My high school English teacher. 
a million times. Because she said I was stupid. I couldn't do it. I wasn't smart enough. And I always said, anytime I got a new job, people said, no, he can't do this. Yeah, I can. So I'd say, no, stay tuned. We'll see about that. No, I always said that to people who said, hey, what are you doing in this job? You can't do it. Uh, we'll see about that. OK, so uh, I'm sure some of you, like Bob Passy is here, uh, writes a letter to the Brainerd Dispatch once a month. Uh, Jack Hickerson, a uh, great professor of English and literature at Southwest State. So, so it's kind of like this. My high school English teacher said I wasn't smart enough. Okay, let me give you this. Dave Durenberger, uh, former U.S. Senator, he was here last month, speaking from right here. Former U.S. Senator, I think, for three terms. And John Marty, the progressive uh, from St. Paul, who's still in the legislature. And we went out and had lunch. I, I said to myself, driving home, I could live store, next door to either one of them. They were so nice. And I, I, I just knew, you know, they'd be great next door neighbors. Well, so uh, 10 days ago, I got an email from Dave Durenberger. No, I don't know, what am I getting an email from? I did thank Dave for lunch and all that. Anyway, okay, so uh, I won't bore you with all the details. So Dave Durenberger, this is 10 days ago. He was in Maplewood, Minnesota, and he went there uh, to visit uh, you probably don't remember Harold Levander. His daughter and husband, they were in this uh, Maplewood Hospital. Uh, I think she had a, a little boy. You know how hospitals have volunteers? You know, people that have had long careers and they volunteer for some hospital to do various things. He happened to be in the room. His name was Randy Young. And uh, I appointed him as Assistant Commissioner of Agriculture back in the 70s. But I haven't seen him in, you know, like decades. So Dave Durenberger, being the curious person that he is, he said to this Randy Young, what, what have you done? You're a volunteer at the house. What have you done over your life? Well, I was in the Department of Agriculture for like 40 years. He said, did you work for John Weefall? He said, yeah, I did. I said, well, how good was he? Now, here's the quote. Randy Young said he was the smartest person I've ever worked for. Period. Smartest person I've ever worked for. Well, who's right, Ann Ackerman? <laughs> or Randy Young? Now, uh, uh, Steve talked about Southwest State, and, and Jack Hickerson is here. So, uh, I was Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Minnesota. And hey, I've been in every town in the state, OK? I've given talks to every farm organization, every rotary club. I've been in every town in the state giving speeches except for the Iron Range. So it's like, man, I know Minnesota like the back of my hand, OK? So anyway, uh, the Southwest State University job opened up. And I thought, well, uh, you know, how am I going to get that job? It's a four-year state university. It's, you know, with Mankato and St. Cloud, but it's one of the smaller ones. But still, I thought, well, they had uh, an opening, and I was in my fifth year as commissioner. And so I thought, well, I'll apply for that job. And one of the history professors, and Jack, you remember Dave Ness, uh, he said, He said, don't even think about it. He said, no. Basically, he said, no one can save Southwest. It's gone. And uh, Steve Wenzel knows this. There were legislators in the 70s who wanted to close it down. 
because the enrollment was plummeting and the union and the administration didn't get along. And no, no kidding, it, w it was uh, two of the buildings had been taken over by uh, state agencies with uh, subparts of their departments in two different buildings at Southwest State. No, so uh, Dave Nass, who's a good friend of mine, said, don't even think about it. No one can save Southwest State. It's done. Those are the kind of jobs I like. <laughs> so, so I got out there in uh, July of 1977. And it took me one month to get the faculty uh, in harmony with me. And part of it was I reinstated six faculty members that the chancellor had fired. And uh, I'll tell you, those six people will never forget me. So, I mean, like I had uh, solidarity with the faculty within one month. This is at Southwest State and Marshall now. But still, the enrollment's going down. So, you know, uh, how am I going to save Southwest State? I had to come up with a solution. So uh, I, I got invited to Ivanhoe High School, which is 20 miles west, just to say hello and give my greetings. And when I went to Ivanhoe High School, you know, I saw the 9th, 10th, and 11th, and 12th grades. No, I talked to all of them. And on the way back, I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to pick up a map of Minnesota. Here's Marshall. You know, it's in southwestern Minnesota. And I looked at every road out of Southwest or out of Marshall, and there were 94 high schools. So I said to myself, look, I'm going to save it myself. Now, uh, I don't know if you know how it works. Like Central Lakes, I think, has two admissions reps, and they go to all the area colleges, OK? OK, and they might see, like up at Pequot Lakes, five or six students who have an interest in coming to Central Lakes. Now, you've read about St. Cloud. Their enrollment has been going down for 10 years. Are you aware of that? And St. Cloud's a really good school. I know I was chancellor for like seven years. And by the way, I could do that job with one hand tied behind my back. I mean, that's Mankato, St. Cloud, Winona, Br you know. Uh, no, that's the easiest job I've ever had. But that's a different story. So St. Cloud has been going down in enrollment. I just read about it today. 10 years in a row. No, I mean, you got a kid. What? St. Cloud's a really good school, and their enrollment's been declining for 10 years. Okay, Southwest State was going to be closed down, okay? Legislators had said, look, we're not going to take this. We're going to close it down. So how much time did I have? Maybe a year and a half. So uh, I looked at these 94 high school. Actually, there were 95. And I said to myself, you know, I, I, I'm probably going to have to go into most of them. No, and w look, when I go in, I'm president of Southwest State. I'm not meeting with five students. I'm meeting with the whole, yeah, like the whole high school. So I remember I called the, uh, the superintendent at Pipestone, and I said, hey, I'm going to be in the area next Tuesday. I said, I'd be more than happy to talk to your students. He could not believe it. He said, we've never had a university president set foot inside of Pepstone High School. So when I went there, again, it was grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. Not five students, the whole high school. So what did I talk about? I had a copy of the Minneapolis Tribune. That's all I had. So I lectured out of the Minneapolis Tribune, you know, about this and that, every issue under the sun. And I also told them about the importance of, I don't care if you go to a Votech or a community college or a state university or a private college. Uh, you've got to do that. Knowledge, what, what I said in every school is knowledge is power. You know what? It still is. Let me say that again. You know, maybe you don't read the paper. You should. Knowledge is power. And if you know more than anybody else, you're going to the top. So anyway, so I went into Worthington, Laverne, and, uh, and you know, thank, thankfully the faculty knew that I was not going to be there that often, maybe uh, Monday morning and Friday afternoon. No, I went into this high school, that high school, 
So let's say in September, October, November, December, uh, through early March, I went into 94 high schools. Who's ever done that? No one. In the history of the world here in Minnesota. No. No one has gone into 94 high schools. And the faculty let me do it because they knew I was saving the place. So, you know, I, and by the way, half, halfway through it, I started recruiting football players because we had the worst football team. And, and near the end of my speech, I'd say, anybody that wants to play football at Southwest, I'll meet you at the other end of the gym. And I actually gave out about 10 scholarships, and five of them started as freshmen, okay? Yeah, I got an eye for talent. I recruited the quarterback out of Granite Falls, and everyone wanted him. I said, you want to start right now, immediately. And by the time he's a junior, he's like all region. He was all conference. Kurt Strasheim was his name. So so anyway, I went into 94 high schools. Now, was that a lot of work? By the way, I'm driving myself. And I'm going to 95, 94, actually. I couldn't do the 95th. I actually got that number, and I, I couldn't do it. I was done. But 94 high schools, now think about that. Do you think anybody at Mankato or St. Cloud or Winona, I'm talking about going back to the Civil War, has ever gone to 94 high schools like in four months? No. I talked to 30,000 high school students, and guess what? The enrollment at Southwest State went up 30% the next fall. Now, I was never near. I mean, thank God the faculty knew what I was doing. So, Jack, would you say I did a good job for Southwest State? You think I saved the place? There you go. See, you get that firsthand. <laughs> okay, so Jim Tate for the Marshall Independent. I got an honorary. <laughs> you know, think about this. I'm nothing. And all of a sudden, in 2007, I got an honorary degree from Southwest State. And they named a road after me. They should have named the administration building after me. But anyway, Jim Tate, who is the editor of the Marshall Independent, and let me just repeat it again. And Jack, you, you remember this. This is in 2007. It's like uh, April 5th. And he said, hey, John Weefald is coming to town. When people hear his name. Everything stops. John Weefald, the guy that saved Southwest State. Now, how many people do you think that have served in all these universities in the last 100 years have an editorial like that? He saved Southwest State. That'll be on my tombstone. Well, anyway. So, you know, Miss Ackerman, I think, was wrong. You know, my high school English teacher? <laughs> no, she was a nice lady. I should have gone to her apartment. You know, when, listen, when I got a master's degree from Washington State with straight A's, I got fellowships from Vanderbilt, Stanford, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin. I should have gone to see her right then and there. And <laughs> I don't know. Why I didn't do that. Okay, so when you talk, no, I've got 100, let's say I have 108 IQ. Let's say that's correct. What the hell does that mean? Or let's say I, took, I got a 19 on the ACT score. What does that mean? It could mean a lot, or it could mean nothing. Now, I had a guy that uh, worked for me for five years who said I was a smart, I didn't know this, by the way. He's never told me that. Dave Durenberger asked him that question. He says, yeah, he's the smartest leader I've ever worked for. Now, I don't know if that's the case, but it means I did a good job. So here's the deal. I'm not saying IQ is not important or ACT scores. Because if you have a 36 ACT, hey, you're going to Harvard and you'll be working for Wall Street. Now, could I get a 36 ACT? No, ever, never. So 
Uh, I don't know if you guys, uh, Bob, I don't know if you've read that book by Daniel Goleman, it's called Emotional Intelligence. You know what emotional intelligence is? So it means you have a caring attitude. It means you have respect for everyone. It means you are gracious to everyone. It means you have a spirit of generosity and you say thank you to everyone. Now that's where I've got a perfect ACT score is with emotional intelligence. You could say I'm a politician. No, I care about people. I don't care who they are, I care about them. So listen, uh, someone who's got emotional intelligence, they never think they're the smartest guy in the room. You know, our last four presidents will all think they're the smartest guy in the room, okay? No, they're not. No, the last four presidents have never apologized for one thing. They always are the smartest guy in the room. I never, ever thought I was the smartest guy in the room. Never. I never thought I was smarter than anybody else. How could I with an IQ of 108, if that's, if that's accurate? So I will tell you this, emotional intelligence trumps, well, let's not use that word, beats a high IQ. Okay, you know what I mean? So if you're, you have emotional intelligence, that is going to be more important for you and your success in life than to have a high IQ, or let's say uh, a 28 on your ACT score. You know, and I always admire students at Kansas State that have a 32 or a 34. They're, very, they're a lot smarter than I am. So um, I always told my two boys, Skip and Andy, to say thanks. Now, do you know how many people cannot say thank you? Yeah, a lot. They never say thank you about anything. I was thank you, thank you, thank you. When I saw people in Anderson Hall at Kansas State, you know, like the custodian, have you ever stopped to say to a custodian here at Central Lakes, hey, by the way, thanks for what you're doing? How about that? Thank you. Or let's say a faculty member does something for you. Do you say thanks? Or if your mom and dad does something for you, do you say thanks? Thank you is like, uh, it could be the most important two words in the dictionary. Thank you. You can't, listen, I'll, I'll tell you this. I thank people all the time at Kansas State. I wore people out by saying thank you. But you know what? People appreciate it. People appreciate it when you, if you're president of the university and you say thanks, like somebody's picking up trash, uh, one of our custodians. I always thank, I, I might invite him up when he finished and I'd give him a coffee cup and a pen and a paperweight, okay? Okay. So let me give you the characteristics here. Now, you don't have to write them down. They're like axioms. They're like truths. They're self-evident. Okay? So I'm talking about myself now. 108 IQ. I was a C student in high school. So... You know what I start out with is the number one axiom, principle that will lead you to success. You know what it's called? The work ethic. You know that there are a million more jobs today than there are people looking for them? Now, I, I know we have a number of athletes in here. And you know what your coaches say? Look, you're a good player, but you've got to work harder. Do you have that work ethic? Okay, what does that mean, by the way? That means if you're working for somebody, a manager, a vice president, a supervisor, a dean, it doesn't make any difference. And that person asks you to do something, 
So when do you do it? Next month? Next week? No, you do it right now. Have you got that? You do it right now. Somebody asks you to do something, you don't wait for weeks. You know, I, I had a great staff at Kansas State. I only had three vice presidents, unlike Minnesota, that's got like 30. I only had three. Vice president for administration, academic affairs, and student affairs. And you know what all of them were? Problem solvers. Are you a problem solver? You know, I wasn't a problem solver in high school. I'm one of the best problem solvers on the earth today. I just, it's kind of like instincts, common sense, doing it right away. So I had these vice presidents that I gave them the authority. It's called empowerment. You know what I mean by empowerment? If you're running a major organization, I mean, let's say you're a football coach. You've got nine coaches like in the Big 12. So you give them the authority to act. So I had three vice presidents, and then, you know, there's four or five, six others that were part of my team. All of them had what? A sense of urgency? They all had the work ethic. They all could solve problems. They could do it all. So we were unstoppable. And I inherited a university kind of like South Coast State that was going nowhere. So when someone asks you to do something, you know, someone you're working for, you drop everything right now. You do it right now. Not tomorrow, not next week. Right now. You got that? Right now. Or that afternoon. Okay, uh, you've heard of Amazon? Why is Amazon so successful? Because they do everything with a sense of urgency. You know, people are trying to catch up. It's not easy. You know, Amazon, they do it right now. So the kind of people who worked for me at Kansas State for 23 years, and I only had like six or seven people that, you know, basically were represented my team. Every single one of them had the work ethic. Every one of them were dedicated, determined. None of them ever gave up. All of them became great problem solvers. And so, you know, there were many times where I had nothing to do. So somebody would knock on the door and say, hey, could I see the president, maybe the faculty member or a custodian or an alum? Hey, can I see the president in the next month? And you know what? No, come in right now. So I was like the quarterback in the free safety. I don't have to make every tackle. But I was available every day. I was there Monday through Friday. Every Monday through Friday. I did that for 23 years. And I was able to do a million other things because I had a great team. A great team around me. You know, look at Nick Saban. Do you think he has a great team around him? Yeah. Oh, Harvey McKay said this. Do you want to get lucky? The harder you work, the luckier you're going to get. Now, again, I, uh, I refer to athletes. When you get a fumble, do you think that's just something that happens? No, you've been working on it. So when there is a fumble and you get it, hey, the game turns around. So Harvey McKay said, the harder you work, the luckier you're going to get. So if you work hard, you will get luck. Now, the question is, do you seize that luck? Like when I was appointed commissioner of agriculture, I was a professor at Gustavus Adolphus. And like Wendy Anderson took me out of that lane and put me into a brand new lane, I was commissioner of agriculture. And when I proved I could do that, I got the job at Southwest State. It helped me get the job at Kansas State because I could manage this large operation. Now, you know what Rudy Perpich told me one time? He was the governor of the fall of Wendell Anderson. He said, John, how much do I like you? You could spit in my mouth and I'd still like you. Of course, he was from like uh, Croatia. <laughs> no, he actually said that. You can spit in my mouth and I'm still gonna like you. I mean, I think he kind of liked me. Well, 
Okay, Sylvester Stallone, you know him. Here's what he said, you know how successful he's been. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I succeed because I keep going, going, going. See, if you work hard and you're unrelenting, listen, nobody can stop you. If you epitomize hard work, dedication, determination, and you never give up, you are going to the top. You are, there's nobody that can stop you, not Miss a a Ackerman or nobody. So my second one is, I got to move along here. It's called The Values of Dedication, Determination, Never Giving Up. So, um, and you know, we all get handed a bad deal or somebody makes a bad decision. It's, it's bad luck. But don't give up. You know, great people never give up. Lincoln lost five times. He never gave up. So if I don't come to K-State in 1986, no, I, I'm telling you what, you know, I followed, I, you know, should we save some low energy people? So when I walked into Anderson Hall, that was the main building, uh, in the summer of 1986, I would say things like, hey, we need a new library. And one of the vice presidents would say, no, we tried that. Or I would say, we're the only school in the Big Eight that doesn't have an art museum. No, we're a, more of an engineering scientific school. No, we got a, an art museum. So, you know, it was like, their favorite response, this is for almost everybody I ran into in the, in the summer of 86. Their favorite word was no. Now, I, let me tell you right now, I don't work with people who say no. You got that? Nobody says no. It's like, no, you can do this. Okay, I want optimist. I, you know, I, I'm just telling you right now, I am not going to work with pessimists. I hate pessimists. No, I want optimistic people around me who are doers, shakers, and movers. Look, if I don't come to K-State in 1986, we don't play football today. We are not in foot, we are not in the Big 12. I'm one of the Big 8 presidents that put the Big 12 together. You ever heard of the Big 12? On July 1 of 2019, you know how much we got from ABC, ESPN? 40 million. So why do you think Nick Saban has 40 people around him? Because the SEC gets about 45 million a year. That doesn't include football receipts, private giving. It's like if you're a member of a Power Five conference, you have so much money you don't know what to do with it. Hey, by the way, the 10 highest paid people uh, at a Big 12 school, the president's not one of the top 10. No, they're all in coaching. The 10 highest paid people in the Power Five conferences like the University of Minnesota, no, they're all in athletics. Why is that? Because they get all this money. The Big Ten distributed $55 million per school. I'm an authority on this. Okay, I put the Big 12 together. If I don't come to K-State, we're in the Missouri Valley today. Playing basketball, that's it. We're a basketball school only like Marquette or Wichita State. Okay. You know what Clint Eastwood said? I don't believe in pessimism. I like Clint Eastwood. Okay, yeah, I don't believe. How about that one? I don't believe in pessimism. No, I don't either. So, okay, here's uh, characteristic number four. To be able to read, write, and speak. Now listen, how hard is that? Okay, now l let me ask you this. Uh, there are a lot of students here. Can you write a one-page memo? Let's say three paragraphs. No spelling errors. No grammatical mistakes. I mean, complete sentences. You get that? To write three paragraphs. Can you do that? Can you write a one-page? I'm talking about right now. Can you write a one-page memo and make no spelling errors, have no grammatical mistakes? You have all complete sentences. So when you can do that, okay, I, I, will, I will tell you this. No, I know this is an oversimplification.
So I would say this. This is for everybody here, faculty, staff, especially the students. If you can read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, okay, from cover to cover, and actually understand. I'm talking about today's New York Times. I'm talking about the Washington Post. If you can read that from cover to cover, there's nothing you can't do. If you can do that, you might as well just graduate from Central Lakes right now. If you can read the Washington Post from cover to cover and understand what's in it, no, you are going to be a success. Period. Amen. Good night. Got that? So I have to say all three because they're so, you know, period, amen, good night. That's it. That means you've got to be able to do it. Okay. The next thing is five. Remember your cell phone and your personal computer. They are not ends in themselves. They are only means to an end. Let me tell you this. Nobody here is going to get a job because you're good on your cell phone. No, no one. No, I've got a cell phone. I just turned it off. No, if you, I mean, your cell phone is not the means to a job. People don't care whether you can work on your cell phone and really be good at it. So, no, America's cell phones, personal computers, they are not going to get you a job. So the former president of the University of Southern California, you know what he said one day? He said this. He's the president of USC. Uh, he's talking about communicating with everybody uh, you know, in his operation. He said this. I became convinced that the best way to communicate is either on the phone or in person. Now, how, how, how much of a genius is he? Yeah, I'd say he's a genius. Because people, you cannot write an email. Okay, I'm telling you right now. Let's say you're president of the University of USC or Kansas State. And you send an email firing somebody, you know what that takes on? Biblical. And they'll never forget it. They'll never get over it. No, don't, you don't do that. You call them into your office and say, hey, I got a few problems with you. I think you'd be better off somewhere else. You don't give bad news to people on a text message or email. Forget that right now. Don't ever do that again. Do it. No. Let's say it's your mom or dad, or a brother or sister, or a friend. You tell them in person. You don't like A, B, or C. In person. Okay. Uh, item six, to have a curious mind. Oh, my goodness. I can't tell you how many people I've met that are not curious about anything. No, to have a curious mind. Are, do you have a curious mind? Are you interested in the world we live in? Do you know what's going on right now, today, in northern Syria? I'm furious about it. Can you find Iran on a map? Can you find Venezuela on a map? Do you know what's going on in these countries? To have a curious mind, I'm telling you what, you have a curious mind, you're going places. Listen, remember this, knowledge is power. Okay, it is power. It's always been true, and it still is right now. Knowledge. That's why you should do everything you can at Central Lakes, then go to Mankato or St. John, but knowledge is power. Okay, uh, <laughs> have a sense of humor. No kidding, I just don't like people that can't laugh. I don't like people that don't have a sense of humor. When I hang around with people, no, they've got a sense of humor. You know what that means? You can laugh at yourself. You know, we've had two presidents since World War II that really had a good sense of humor. John Fitzgerald Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. You know, they can laugh at themselves. That's why Reagan never got impeached because he was so nice. <laughs> I mean, he had a sense of humor. Now, okay, do you see what I mean? Please, I beg you, try to laugh at yourself and, and laugh at others, and with them, not against them, but have a good sense of humor. Okay. 
Okay, now I'm down to my eighth one. I'll get that. So you have you written all of these down now? <laughs> no. I mean, they're basic. They're American. They're fundamental. Okay, you know what the last one is? When you make a mistake, apologize. Now, how many people can never apologize? You know, half the American people. Did you just point at that guy? Yeah. You, you, <laughs> you can't apologize? No, I'm sure he's just kidding. No, but listen. Really, if somebody makes a mistake, well, let's say you make a mistake. It could be with a friend, a teacher. Um, I mean, let's say you're a manager or a supervisor, or you're president, and you make a mistake. And I made many mistakes as president of Kansas State, and, and two big, big ones. And how did I solve that problem? I met with like uh, 1,500 uh, students in the faculty. I was gonna transfer two colleges to, and merge them with two others. No, it didn't go. So I met with him. And I didn't have the provost with me today. He knew a lot more about why we were doing this than anybody else. Here's what I said, though. Here's what I said. I didn't say if I offended you. Look, that is not an apology. You got that? That's what they do in Hollywood. They say, you know, they've offended the whole world. And they say, no, if I offended you, no, you've offended the whole frickin' world. No, that is, no, if I offended you, that is not an apology. So what I did at Kansas State in these, and I always did generally, but I just said, hey, I apologize. I made a mistake. See, then you have to add this. It's never going to happen again. So... You have to apologize completely, totally, and categorically. Let's say it's your mom or dad. You have to apologize. You have to look them in the face and say, hey, I'm sorry. It will never, you don't say to your mom or dad, if I offended you, no, yeah, you did that 10 times over. No, you just say, I apologize right now. And you know what? It's never going to happen again. I can't tell you how, what a difference that makes. Uh, I call a, a limited apology, a limited hangout apology. You know, so many of these Hollywood types say, if I offended any of you, uh, I'm sorry. No, you're not. No, you've offended the whole world. So just apologize to the whole world. And be serious. Okay, here's the deal. So, uh, Well, I would just sum up uh, my comments by saying uh, that uh, our Central Lake students, our faculty and friends, you are blessed to be here. So don't forget we live in the greatest country in the face of the earth where you can be anybody. You can be somebody. You have the privilege of attending a very excellent community college. Uh, you know, Brainerd High School is really good. All of you have unique, special and God-given abilities. So if you have the work ethic, if you have the determination, if you never give up, you know, like Vince Lombardi said, how many teams get to the one-yard line? They can't shove it over. Listen, if you get to the one-yard line, you've got no choice. It's a touchdown or just forget playing football ever again. You've got to get to the one-yard line and shove it over. Many people in life get to the one-yard line, and they just give up. Oh, this is too much. No, they give up on the one-yard line. So if you can look in the mirror, like this afternoon, anytime this afternoon you look in the mirror and you say to yourself, I am somebody, can you do that? Can you say that to yourself? I am somebody. Well, listen, I could go on and on. I was very fortunate. 
I've got an $80 million building named after me at Kansas State, you know, because I did a good job. And by the way, they named, <laughs> I'd even forgotten about this, they named a pavilion, the city paid for uh, a pavilion, but cost them $12 million, they call it the John and Ruth Ann Pavilion. And so I wouldn't be here without Ruth Ann. She's the best. So, um, you know, I don't go around, you know, okay, so I have an $80 million, it's really a nice building, by the way. <laughs> And, and you can see, we have a, no, I mean, Ann Ackerman, where in the hell are you? How did I get an $80 million building named after me? And you know the sign? You can see it from outer space. And they even have a portrait of me inside. I mean, it's like, uh, and the restaurant is like a five-star restaurant like you'd see on a cruise ship. So, uh, so anyway, I've been very fortunate, Ann Ackerman, God bless you, I hope you're in heaven somewhere. But you, you uh, Ann Ackerman's made my career. No, really, Ann Ackerman. Every time I run into a problem, I think about Ann Ackerman, a high school English teacher who said I was dumb. Okay, and you've had people tell you you're dumb. No, you're not. So, uh, well, God bless you, God bless Central Lakes, and uh, I wish you all the best, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So listen, I, I know uh, some of you guys, uh, some of you guys have to go to class. But listen, I'm willing to hang around for uh, uh, anybody that has any questions uh, for 10 minutes or so. But I, I understand that some of you have to go to class or go to lunch. Uh, but anyway, thank you.